Thank you, Jay. I'm really excited. Um, I, for those of you who've seen Marvel, it is truly marvelous. Uh, I think it represents how seriously people are taking Elasticsearch now. Your uh, growth in downloads, in my mind, is completely uh, understandable. Very exciting technology, and really glad we could all be here today. Weather held out, so uh, let's get started. This is me. And what I'm hoping that you'll be able to take away from today's presentation is sort of our approach. This is going to be sort of a mid-level technical details-wise on Elasticsearch. I'm not going to baby you through the beginning. Uh, I think a lot of you have, have seen that stuff. So how we've approached routing, how we've approached mapping and custom analysis. And I heard a discussion earlier about how to ingest documents, how, how documents come from a relational database and enter into the search index. That's going to be a big focus. That was one of the big problems that we, we've solved. I'll show several techniques that we've uh, considered in doing that and some of the pros and cons uh, so that you can learn from our experience and you'll walk away feeling more confident about being able to integrate Elasticsearch just you know, really on any relational database. We're using uh, MS SQL. A lot of you know, people are using different things, but the techniques I'll show hopefully will generalize fairly well uh, to your environment. So where are we? Today was a big day for NGB Van. We passed the one billion document mark uh, in production, according to HQ. Now that's a uh, big, you know, the number seems really big there because they're also counting all the uh, replicated documents. So it's, uh, since we're keeping a uh, number of replicas at one, uh, it's actually about half of this for the primary store. About 375 gigabytes of data. We're using, and this is something that I learned out of, uh, I believe it was HipChat's, uh, one of HipChat's blogs. Um, on Elasticsearch, that so you can put two nodes up front to sort of just balance request, response, and coordinate. And they can also take master as well, uh, and then sort of keep the data nodes in the back. Uh, and they can, also, they can also take master, but this is how they achieved uh, a great deal of scale. So that was interesting to So four, four nodes are sort of the data nodes, which have um, a lot of RAM and disk uh, that are holding uh, the index data set that falls on the request uh, response nodes. So the coordinators up front on line. I'm sorry. What is your company? Right, uh, next slide, sorry. <laughs> um, so, oh, uh, so for us, for us, a lot of RAM ended up being uh, 32 gigabytes on each of the, uh, the data nodes. Uh, and we, we had, you know, it depends on how much, you know, how your caches are rolling and things like that, so it's hard to give any kind of real prescriptive advice there. Uh, but that, in our case, is that. Uh, are these uh, documents, uh, nested documents, or just a single? So the question was, uh, are these documents nested, or are they just plain parent child? I'll get to that, so I'll talk a little bit about how we map our relationships to the question. And a lot of this is log stash, right? We just started blasting in uh, as much log stash as we could. Uh, we had a, a bunch of uh, bar log directories that were huge on some servers and said, hey, what the heck, we'll put log stash on here and start blasting in a lot of logs. So the majority of this data actually is not uh, sort of our, our primary data, but we have at least experienced a lot of search and scale by doing that. So what is our business? Uh, kind of going back to answer the, the uh, previous question. So we are a multi-tenant application, and we work for uh, political organizations who are trying to raise money, primarily. So they are looking, they basically have huge lists of voters, and they are trying to say, uh, basically, cut us a check, give us a contribution, and we're going to use that money to get ourselves elected. So we keep track of these campaign contributions, and then there's a great amount of searching and reporting that's done on them. Uh, the company sort of grew out of the niche of filing federal election reports. So the federal government and all the states have requirements uh, that you have to comply with, and they're different in all the states. You can imagine what a regulatory mess it is. We help these campa campaigns comply with that as part of doing that since we were holding all the data and sort of acting like they're QuickBooks in a lot of ways. We expanded to do sort of targeted email, uh, <coughs> online contribution pages, and so the sort of the purview of the company uh, grew out of that. So uh, our scale is not, it's really you know, not true web scale. It's fairly large, you know, 10 to 100 million records um, is what we're talking about. So not billions and billions, uh, although it's pretty clear that uh, Elasticsearch is up to the task. Uh, so what does the data flow look like? We do have some online forms uh, so that the, the campaign has a form builder. Uh, they you know, construct the form elements, uh, integrate in a PayPal merchant account and then they want to send out a blast email, basically, and have people come and put in their credit card, put in you know, sort of the minimal amount of information required by law, and to take that and put that into their coffers. Uh, they're also bringing in sell sheets. So you know, these campaigns, people travel, uh, the campaign directors have been on 10 campaigns in the past. They have these huge, dirty lists of you know, 
10,000, 100,000 people that, okay, they want to do this huge bulk, uh, bulk insert basically into their database. They're coming from another customer, they want to bootstrap up with that data. That's uh, another place. And then of course, data entry, people keying you know, at the keyboard, uh, entering new contributors or people who uh, you know, we think will be fine. Uh, basically, that's all, all funneled into uh, an app tier, our, our website, our API, and uh, the primary record store is SQL Server, as I mentioned earlier. Any more questions about uh, business stuff? All right, so this is one of our uh, important search screens. This is actually not the most uh, complex search screen. This is our dumbed down search. Um, but uh, there's actually two different searches shown on this page. The, uh, the structured search you see up top, um, which actually can be expanded into several relationships there. And then the quick search, which is uh, basically tries to be an autocomplete uh, for the contact. You put in a minimum, minimal number of characters and uh, you, know, you want the person to surface very quickly. Um, so I'll be discussing both of these. Um, specifically, the analysis around this one is more interesting, so we'll see more there. So before Elasticsearch, uh, what did this look like? It was fairly naive usage of C-sharp and Link. Uh, anyone in the house used any framework, uh, that, that technology? <laughs> okay, so you're gonna see some of the, uh, some of the things any framework can do to your database uh, just right up front here. We took in values from the form. This probably looks pretty familiar. We're binding form values. Um, notice contribution, that sort of array notation is saying that there exists a contribution that has an amount greater than $50. Um, we construct a C-sharp expression bump contact rule. So that's an expression tree uh, representing uh, a function which takes contact and returns pool. It's a predicate uh, on contact. We pass to any framework. We'd say any framework, ORM of my dreams, uh, construct a SQL query that uh, you know, it's gonna get me all this stuff and do it fast, and this is what we get. Okay, let's take a look at that monster. Uh, yeah. So we typed in exactly two things on this screen you might be able to, to, to deduce. Uh, one of them is you know, 50 bucks, the greatest 50 bucks, and the like Adam, look at that double-sided wild card, right? This is just a SQL monstrosity. See the inner queries, not even properly joining, yeah. So our DBA quiz. <laughs> and our database lights on fire. <laughs> All right, no, seriously, so, so we're, taking this, we're taking this and uh, part of what we're doing now is, or what we're planning to do, this is sort of a grow to uh, the bottom part, the bottom search is live in production. This part is coming to production. This is going to get turned into a has a child. Uh, and basically that double-sided wild carding, hey, that's going to work great, uh, you know, with even just the standard uh, tokenizer. So I'll, I'll talk, I, the focus a little later on is on how to do that autocomplete, which is a little more interesting. This sort of is to get out of the box to map things uh, correctly. So one of the interesting things that we uh, had to approach when we came, when we started, wanted to deploy a lot of search, like, okay, we've got this jar, and it comes up real quick. Uh, how is this gonna work with developers, right? Everyone's got a different workstation. Are they gonna be all hitting the same index? Like. What, how is it going to version itself? How is it going to go to staging? How is it going to go to production? How are we going to manage that? So one decision we made was, so we put a cluster in, uh, we have a cluster upstairs uh, on virtual machines, we have a cluster in production, and we have a cluster in Boston. It's the internal clusters, we have a one-to-one -one mapping between application instances, so that the app on you know, my laptop has its own index in the internal cluster, in our internal cluster, and then each of our sort of production environments has its own index in the, uh, in the production environment. So that allows us to change the mapping. So if I need to change a mapping locally, I can do that uh, and see how that works, play with that before I go to production um, and change mappings there. Uh, so routing, routing became important for us. Um, how, many, how many people in the house are, are familiar with routing or using routing? Um, okay, so not too many. Uh, routing is, Basically, so by default, Elasticsearch, you notice its object IDs uh, sort of look like a hash, right, that key. What it's doing is distributing out to the shards uh, based on that hash. That's sort of its hash balancing function. You can tell it, uh, look, I know a little bit more about this data. I know there's locality to this data. Because we have a multi-tenant system, you know, tenant one is one campaign, tenant two is another campaign, why don't we hint it to you where to put the data uh, on which shard? 
that's what routing allows you to do is to uh, is to basically establish data locality. So when you're doing requests, Elasticsearch can get smarter about, hey, I only need to go to this shard because I know I'm doing a query uh, for this client. And so that saves you that saves you a lot. You can use Elasticsearch without routing and just have it balance the data out. ES is more selective at indexing query time. So there's a big gotcha here, and actually this is one of the big bugs that hopefully you can learn from. We didn't have routing to being in, and I added routing, and the delete, the, the delete by ID stopped working. So if you're doing gets or deletes by an ID, you have to make sure to include that routing key, because otherwise um, it will seem like it worked, but it actually, the data is not going away. So we had a big production bug because of this. When I went to, uh, to using routing, uh, that's something to be aware of. So you'll, you know, you'll not see the data on a get, and the delete is even more dangerous because it looks like you deleted, but you haven't actually deleted. The data is still there. How do you map relationships? So this goes back also to one of the earlier questions, right? There's there's two different ways basically: the nested and the parent child. So the nested keeps the document all together, um, but in the mapping basically says uh, this is uh, this part, this sub document is a nested relation, it will end up in the same uh, Lucene segment so that uh, things are very fast, operations are very fast when you need to relate those things. Parent child, uh, the, so you all you have one big document at the end of the day, which is a nice, nice part of, that's a pro in my mind, um, of using nested. One of the problems is, uh, you know, you can't surface those inner documents without surfacing the entire document, the entire source. So that's sort of where parent child comes in. Parent child allows you to map, um, to index the documents separately, and even the children can even exist before the parent exists. You're just saying, hey, look, this child has parent ID, whatever. When its parent comes in, it just makes sure that there is a locality to those uh, within the <coughs> indexing. So we are using parent child because we had, you know, we want to be able to write a contribution search that returns contributions. Forget everything else about contact. So that pretty much necessitates, you know, unless you're going to start pulling apart the documents. You know, using that uh, parent child. Now, there is nothing that prevents you from uh, using both of these. Um, you know, you may have a situation where you want to use nested because you want to keep the document together. It really depends on on your use case. Uh, custom analysis. So, multi-field mappings are really cool. Uh, what a multi-field mapping is, you have something like name, right? And the standard tokenizer is going to sort of is so going to rip that apart. The standard analyzer is going to rip that apart, um, and you're going to start sorting by it. But you're noticing that hey, it's only sorting by the tokens. What's going on here? You start <coughs> fastening by it, let's say in Kibana, and you suddenly you see all the tokens coming out instead of the uh, the original uh, term, the original uh, piece of text that was that you provided to us in search of the field. Um, so you can use something called multi-field mappings. So when you provide when you provide a name, so the document has a name, colon, Craig, uh, Craig Leibowitz, I want Craig Leibowitz to be stored in original so that I can sort by CRAIG space L. But then I might also want uh, a different analysis, uh, let's say n-grams, to do something like uh, autocomplete. You can do both of those and keep all of that data in your index, and then you refer, that, refer to them like name.original or name.quickbuck. <laughs> So you can do this as much as you want. The only trade-off is the space that's required um, of course, to store all this data. The way we accomplish that search at the bottom, uh, the quick find search. So basically, they wanted to be able to do basically arbitrary substrings. If you think about it, like a double-sided wildcard. So if my name is Craig Leibowitz, if I type C space L, then you know, pro our product people said that's supposed to come back with Craig Leibowitz. Um, so the way we did that was to use n-grams. Notice these are not edge n-grams, these are actual full n-grams. So C space L is actually one of the terms that is produced by that analyzer because we're using that, uh, that custom analyzer. So we set the, the index analyzer to this, but the search analyzer is keyword because we don't want tokenization. That's C space L. We don't want that to be split apart and mashed against terms. We, we want that to find specifically that n-gram. Uh, but at the same time, we can, use, we can, we can do uh, you know, a bool query to uh, include exact matches against the original name, so you could just paste in um, exactly that name and get back a person as well without having to go to the uh, Phone numbers, you know, we, you know, we didn't want the users to have to type things like you know, open paren, close paren, hyphens. Those are sort of irrelevant. 
we use a card filter there, so you can basically just define you know, the regex of the things that you care about, let's say digits, and it's only going to uh, sort, it's only going, it's going to basically rip those out before doing any kind of, uh, from, your, from all of your terms. All right, so I know I'm going a little fast here, but hopefully you guys are, you guys are following along. So this, this answers the question, this, this, this segment answers the question of how do we uh, get data out of our relational database as it's changing, right, into the search index. And there's a bunch of different techniques to doing this. Um, <clears throat> the technique that we are currently using in production, I consider the old school technique, is a trigger, on an, an after update trigger, uh, an after insert trigger on the uh, primary tables, which then does an insert into change tables, which are then monitored by a background process, rejoined against the, uh, the primary table, and indexed in bold. So there are a couple different ways to do that. SQL Server has something called a change tracking feature. Now this is different than change data capture. <coughs> it's a transaction log walking process. The change tracking really implements, you know, in the covers it's using a version, it's using a, a row version column to create a virtual table that essentially exposes the same thing as that change table where you tell it, hey, for the next, uh, you give it an amount of time over which it will keep those changes uh, in, in a virtual table that you can just select back out of. So it is actually very similar to this. Notice in both of these techniques, we're having to go pull back into the database um, and rejoin and rejoin the primary tables to get the changes out. Now this hasn't been a problem in our, in our production scenario. However, if you study sort of Microsoft best practices and sort of the forward only, sort of information forward only um, mantra, you know, using a trigger and writing into a SQL Server message broker queue is really the fastest way because you're handing the data, the message broker send is very, very fast and you're, you're never having to go back and rejoin. You're basically just taking, uh, denormalizing the data if you need to, um, inside of the trigger itself and doing the, the insert, and then you can use like wait for receive T-SQL to do sort of like a long pull uh, up against that and take out batches. Uh, are there any questions? I know this is sort of dense. So that is primarily going to work because you're an parent child. <coughs> you wouldn't, or would you try to invoke that from, uh, I mean, if you went with the last approach, you're kind of screwed if you have a nested relationship. That's right, because you wouldn't really want to, that's exactly right, you really wouldn't want to incur that join. It's all about speed inside that trigger, because remember, that trigger is inside your actual transaction that's committing, and we want to be as lightweight on the existing uh, RUMS as possible. So yeah, that's a very good point. In our cases, it, it is all in the same database. Um, I guess if it was in separate databases, uh, it still could work. If you, if you had like a foreign key that wasn't a real foreign key, this actually could still work well because at the end of the day, if you're using parent child, you'd now be able to search across them uh, to use that, but we don't, we don't actually have that. Any other of this? I'm actually going to go into a little more detail about what sort of pull apart what the steps are here because you know, triggers exist in other relational database systems, so these things are actually of general of general use. One of the things you'll notice is we, in our process that goes back through um, and does the indexing, we are denormalizing, so we're joining more tables here, which we would not really want to do in this. Uh, right, so. This, con this is a, a, a greatly oversimplified version of basically the uh, relationship that we're sorting in our database. You know, a contact is Craig and I gave, you know, two years ago, uh, I gave 500 bucks to Hillary Clinton. So that's sort of what's being uh, represented in these tables. And so in general, you can create these uh, change tracking tables for doing it in its own schema. Uh, and we're just including uh, basically the, uh, the key information uh, from the original table, because we want that to be really fast, right? We want that uh, insert to be fast. There are also no indexes on that, that's a key. Because again, we don't want to maintain an extra index. We want to be as lightweight as possible um, on the existing transaction. And then we have, this is just sort of the information flow. We have the indexing application, which is a background Windows service in our case, which is taking batches out of contact uh, change tracking. And, we, and then we have you know, phone change tracking, email change tracking. Uh, all going back into a parent-child mapping. 
the indexing application is taking care of all of those. Right, so the five required pieces, the trigger, the change table. Now, if you're using if you're using the change data, uh, change tracking feature of SQL Server, uh, you know, these two might be given for you. Uh, the extraction procedure, the mapping, and the indexing application. And this indexing application, we were able to sort of wrap up in a generic way uh, where we could provide the entity name and the keys, and it would actually write out the SQL to do the uh, do the indexing. So it was, it was lightweight, and we needed to add a new type. So the trigger, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with T-SQL uh, trigger syntax, but uh, the thing to note here is this, uh, this is going to happen inside the transaction, and you can certainly update it's inserted as a virtual table showing what rows changed, what rows were inserted, and then deleted is in the delete case. The delete case is interesting because we need to do we need to do a different operation on Elasticsearch in the delete case. We need to do a delete. Uh, now you can do that in the same bulk. It's very interesting. You can have a hybrid bulk. You know, where there's index, 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 delete, delete, index. Um, so that that actually works fairly nicely. We just need to track that bit to know to do the delete uh, Elasticsearch operation. So that's put into the table as well, and that would be in any change tracking table that you know follows this sort of pattern. So there's another optimization uh, that I'll point you out. This is the first place it appeared because I changed the slide. This is index. So originally, the, the queries that were um, the indexing application was running were a delete from output. So delete from output basically is an atomic SQL Server T SQL that's doing uh, you know a delete on the table and then providing you back the rows that it, it did delete. So it's going to allow you to scale that out. The problem with that is that resizing it, you know, delete is actually an expensive operation um, on a SQL Server table. And I was looking at it, and I'm like, hey, this is only index, you know, it's, it's actually started indexing very slowly. And I knew it wasn't Elasticsearch. I'm looking at it, it's like, okay, these three contacts took five seconds to, to delete. Well, why is that happening? Uh, it ends up being much faster to keep this is indexed with default of zero and doing an update from output. So that simple little trick actually reduced it down to milliseconds. Now, in the background, of course, you, you now need to clean up, uh, but that cleanup ends up just not really affecting the other process very much, and it ends up working very well. So this is where a queue would be more useful in this activity. That's right. The queue, you know, you wouldn't have to clean up after. You wouldn't have to do this, this table trick. So this really is, is the anti-pattern of a table as a queue. Uh, but it works. Uh, it, it works very, very well in our in our circumstances. Now, you know, if you have a different transactional pattern, you may find it doesn't work for you. You need to go to to use the uh, uh, you know a queue if you have that inside of your database. You may not. Um, so there are, are it depends on your situation. Uh, the extraction procedure. So this is a bit of a simplified version, like so. I can get it on this slide. Um, you know, in memory, it'll fit uh, temp table. This is the delete from output, so I didn't change this slide. This would end up being become, uh, you know, update top set is index one, where is index zero in the optimization I just talked about. But back to, after this, it ends up being the same. And then our denormalization. So, you know, I'm not just interested in contact, that contact changed, but I'm also interested in putting together in this document you know, a sub-collection of address, email address, phone. So one of the cool things is I figured out a way to write uh, this generically so that they can figure out um, basically these things that are joined in uh, from the returned uh, result set, it figures out and reconstructs the document in a conventional way. So you don't have to write that one off every time. And that's actually something that uh, I think I'll be open sourcing at some point, so take it. Keep an eye on my, uh, my Twitter view. This is the extraction procedure. Notice the no locks. So potentially, um, you could be joining a little data here, but this is a way to keep it lightweight um, on the existing system. All right, the mapping. So here's our mapping for contact. So a couple things to notice. Uh, the routing is done by 10 IDs. This says use the tenant ID field in the document as you're routing. <coughs> This is the more light field uh, display name. I believe they changed something slightly about this in 1.0. So the syntax, the syntax all is uh, we're running 9.0.9 in production. 
the original display name is not analyzed, so we can sort of find it. And the quick search uses this, um, the specific index analyzer and search analyzer that I talked about earlier. How does parent child work? So it's easy. Parent of a contribution is a contract. Property is hinting at a flow. Elasticsearch, of course, will evolve these mappings for you, so this really is uh, not entirely necessary. Uh, but you know, when you want to do, you could you could you could limit this down to just the things that you wanted to custom analyze, and, and let it figure out the rest. Of course, you're going to need to provide something like this, though. Right, the indexing application. We're going to pull the change tracking table and call the get changes procedure. We've had a lot of success, and I really can recommend. I think it's still you know pre, way pre 1.0, but the Nest uh, client for Elasticsearch to .NET. If you're in .NET space, uh, works really well. Um, sort of acts as almost documentation has a great fluid interface, um, and really helps you learn Elasticsearch. Sort of like um, the uh, Sense plugin helps you learn by giving you that IntelliSense. You can sort of get the same experience if you start using a tool like uh, LinkPad and uh, including that NuGet package for Nest. I can recommend that. So changes that we want to make, right? You may have said in the back of your head, well, Craig, you shouldn't be using ngrams anymore. You should be using the completion suggester, the suggester which uh, sort of showed up on the scene uh, as they, I think they incremented to a version of Lucene, like 4.6 or something that started having this. It's some new research that's a finite state transducer, so it, it actually stores uh, in the segments a trellis of sort of character to character, which is a, it, it's sort of a compressed encoding for autocomplete. Um, it, I don't think it will do exactly what our product team wanted out of the engrams, but I have a feeling when they when they look at the results that they're going to think that this is good enough. And really, I think a lot of, uh, we're spending a lot of data. If you think about the number, if you have a, a piece of text that's 20 characters long, the number of engrams uh, between you know, 3 and 15 characters, that's a lot of characters, right? So you're, you're making a big sacrifice, engineering trade off there, you know, saying, look, I'm going to you know, give it the RAM, give it the storage space, and, uh, but it's going to work. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to change over to using SQL Service Broker, you know, queries that, that pull or you know, sort of stink. Uh, the, the long polling of service broker is sort of nice. You can say basically leave this, you know, uh, wait for, receive, uh, and give it a timeout of like 60 seconds. So if there's nothing new coming through, it's just sitting there basically until that next record comes in, it will come back and it can limit the number of results that come back. Um, we are actively converting over our multi-step search. Uh, and the, these expressions that we were building in .NET actually uh, translate fairly well to the expressions that you end up building in JSON to uh, instruct Elasticsearch, right? Multi-step search, okay, use a bool filter, use a bool query. Um, the, the concepts actually apply fairly directly, so our representation of the existing user searches that are multi-stepped, uh, we don't think we're gonna have too much of a problem with. You know, we're gonna have to expand out, of course, the data that we're indexing. We're not quite indexing enough yet, but that's a go-to. Uh, another Interesting application is we have this Linux server, our MTA, so mail transfer agent. We use one for eCelerity for blasting email. You know, we spend, send a lot of political spam. Uh, and we, it's a cluster, actually, MTA cluster. So these things send out, you know, can send out, you know, three million emails an hour um, each, and they write these crazy log files, right? So if you take something like Logstash, we just, this is one of the things I did in the beginning to prove scale. And we just, I just pointed it at the var log directory, and I built up some uh, sort of conditional, you know, there's like a type discrimination as to how, what this log line is gonna look like. You know, you write the regex to, to get the, to get, you know, the tokens out, basically. Um, so, previously we had a system that went and interacted with uh, the MTA uh, Perl script that read through a J log, which was a different data structure, that itself was consuming these logs. Uh, and then we had web, it was, was taking web, using web services to ship uh, these, you know, the data that's coming back is basically this bounce, this mailbox is full, or this was delivered, this was received. This is so much more direct because we're getting more, we're just doing way less work, right? We're just using log stash, just give me everything you got. Uh, we'll query it later. So it's ingesting just, I think, over 50% of our uh, actual total data in production are these logs from the mailer. Um, so things that are producing huge verbose logs, like I recommend 
uh, log stash is super flexible in, in the way it's very beautiful in the way it, it handles filtering and sort of multi-step processes with regex uh, sort of Ruby like definition. It's worth considering for, for existing systems that are producing these huge logs, you know, put them all in there and uh, your primary system then you can develop queries to, uh, to query out. You might be able to use Kibana, you know, consider using Kibana inside of our app, right? We'll just restyle it a little bit and we'll be building out features. It just, it's so much more direct, so much more is given to you than having to, uh, you know, to retool everything yourself. Uh, two thank yous to go out. Uh, one to my former boss, Troy Good, uh, who got me excited about Logsash, or about Elasticsearch. I think that was like nine months ago. I mean, it, was, it was a while ago. Uh, sort of lit the fire and uh, socialized the idea within the company. Uh, and my wonderful wife, who has tolerated me reading my, my phone late at night, uh, keeping up on all the uh, what's cooking, and uh, watching all, all the materials that you guys are putting online. So thank you very much.